Has everybody had a good RubyConf so far? Yes? Okay, so I know it's uh, Saturday afternoon, um, so you know I'll try to keep it light. Um, so I guess today, you know, hi. I, my name's Tom. Uh, I work for New Relic. Uh, I uh, work on the mobile monitoring and Linux server monitoring products. Uh, we're hiring, so if you're looking for a job, uh, please feel free to spam us with your resumes. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about rapid programming, la la uh, rapid programming language prototypes using Ruby and Rack, um, which is essentially you know, compiler construction using Ruby. Uh, now, before I get started, I just want to make it clear that I'm talking about Rack and not Rack. Um, so Rack with a K is web server middleware. So I'm not going to be speaking about uh, Thin or Unicorn or Sinatra or Rails or anything like that. Um, I'm talking about Rack, which is a parser generator for uh, Ruby. OK, so when I first sort of put the proposal for this presentation together, um, I kind of had it in my head that my target audience would sort of be people who have you know, maybe toyed with uh, compiler construction in the past and had some experience using uh, Yak and Bison and, and all that sort of stuff. But Matt's uh, keynote on Thursday sort of made me realize that, you know, maybe that was a, a bit too ambitious and, you know, I, I should sort of scale it back a little bit to uh, sort of give people who haven't that experience um, some exposure to, uh, in, you know, compiler construction fundamentals. Um, and so the first part of this presentation, probably the first 10 to 15 minutes, is uh, basically uh, an intro to compiler construction, basic theory, um, the architecture behind a, a generalized compiler. Uh, and and this, this is great information because, you know, this, this stuff can be applied to pretty much any, you know, modern uh, com uh, compiler, in, you know, compiler that you, that you care to look at. So if you go digging inside the uh, Ruby compiler, uh, these, tech, these concepts apply. Uh, likewise, Python, uh, PHP even, um, all of this stuff, you know, it sort of applies across the board. Once I've sort of covered off the fundamentals, uh, I'm going to dive into uh, Rack and, you know, when you might want to use it instead of Yak or Bison. Uh, and I'm going to finish up with some live coding. So, when I say finish up, uh, probably two thirds of this presentation is, is live coding. So I'm going to sort of try and implement a, a compiler here on the stage in front of you, um, and you all get to laugh at my horrible, horrible Ruby code. Okay, so first up, what is a compiler? A compiler takes code in a source language, uh, then magic happens, and then out the other end, uh, the target code comes out. And so the way I like to think of a compiler is, is sort of as a, uh, as a pipeline uh, with several sort of steps along the way. So there's several transformations applied to your source code along the way before it gets dumped out as, you know, your, your target code. Uh, and the first step in that process is uh, the scanner. So the, uh, once again, if you think of your compiler as, as a pipeline, the scanner is like the first component in that pipeline that sort of takes your raw so source code and tries to identify, uh, you know, interesting tokens within that source code, like this is an if, this is an if keyword, this is a bracket, uh, this is a string, semicolon, that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, it might strip out all the white space and comments and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's really just sort of chunking up your input um, to make it easier to digest. Um, so those tokens, uh, you know, sort of form a stream or an array or however you want to sort of conceptualize it. And that feeds into the parser. The parser takes those tokens and sort of tries to make, make sense of, of that raw input uh, using a set of rules. And I've got up on the, on the projector there, you know, it, it outputs an intermediate representation, um, which is so, you know, generic as to be meaningless. Um, so I've given the, the example of an abstract syntax tree, uh, which you may have heard of. Uh, if you haven't, I'll sort of cover that in more detail in a moment. Um, so I, I'm going to treat the rest of this presentation as though the parser uh, always outputs an abstract syntax tree, but it's probably important to note that it doesn't necessarily have to do that. It can even, you know, directly generate bytecode. Uh, now, parsers, you can, make, you can manually write parsers, so it's actually pretty trivial to, to write, like, a, a top-down recursive descent parser uh, by hand. Uh, but generally, you know, what you tend to see out in the wild is people will use things called parser generators uh, to take a, a grammar 
and automatically generate a, a parser for the, the language described in the grammar. And so a grammar, as you might suspect, describes the complete syntax of a programming language. Um, has everybody sort of heard of uh, EBNF? Sort of, maybe, no, kind of? Uh, that's, that's okay, it, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, you'll sort of see an example later on in the presentation, a very, very simple example. Uh, and essentially, variants of EBNF uh, are used for uh, the DSLs that serve as inputs to parser generators. Uh, so an example of a parser generator would be Yak or Bison or even Rack. Uh, so before I mentioned an abstract syntax tree. Um, so this is really just, you know, sort of giving you more detail about what an abstract syntax tree actually is. Um, so it's an in-memory logical representation of your source program. Um, so it's just a data structure, basically. So you start with this raw, uh, you know, blob of source code. It passes through the scanner. The scanner converts it into tokens. The tokens are fed into the parser. The parser structures those tokens into uh, an AST. Um, so it's, it's abstract in the sense that it, uh, we omit some detail as well. So by the time we get to an abstract syntax tree, we don't care that our if statement uh, requires brackets around the test expression, for example. Uh, contrast to a concrete syn syntax tree, which does include that, that sort of detail. OK, so we've got our AST, or you know, quote, unquote, intermediate representation. Uh, and now we want to generate code uh, from that intermediate representation. So in the case of an AST, we traverse the tree and generate the appropriate code for each node along the way. So if you're working with uh, an if node, for example, you would set the, the code generator would look at the if node and go, aha, this is an if node, so I know to generate uh, code for the test expression associated with that if node, uh, and I know to generate code to test whether that expression is true, and I know I need to generate a jump to jump over the body of the if statement if, uh, uh, if the expression evaluates to false, and I need to generate the code for the body itself. And so there, you know, that's all done sort of recursively. Like it, the, the code general generator can recurse, recurse into the various nodes in the AST. OK, so I kind of spoke about the compiler essentially being a, uh, a pipeline. And this is kind of the, the diagram, you know, that sort of shows you what's going on. So the raw, code, raw source code feeds into the scanner. The scanner produces tokens. The tokens feed into the parser. The parser constructs an AST, the AST feeds into the code generator, and the code generator finally dumps out your target code. Okay, so that kind of concludes the sort of, you know, 10,000 foot view of, you know, compiler construction in general. Uh, so now for a little bit about Rack. So Rack, as you probably might have guessed by now, is a parser generator, uh, written by Tenderlove. <laughs> uh, you write your grammar using uh, a sort of DSL, which I'll sort of demonstrate in a minute. You run uh, rack over your grammar, uh, and that will generate Ruby code that can pass the language that you describe in your, in your grammar. So why would you use rack over something like Yak or Bison? Um, well, I, I tend to use rack when I'm sort of uh, experimenting you know, with crazy ideas or trying to, trying to learn, basically. I'm, I'm relatively new to you know, the whole compiler construction thing myself. And so whenever I want to spin up a new project or something like that, essentially something that I'm probably going to throw away, uh, I get really frustrated when I have to you know, do the magical dance uh, required to get uh, Yak, Bison, Flex, and C, and everything working together. Uh, not to mention you know, the fact that Ruby gives you hashes and arrays and all that sort of stuff for free. Uh, so really for me, it's, it's about you know, getting from uh, 0 to 100 as quickly as possible. OK, this is Sucklang. Um, Sucklang is essentially a DSL for calling functions um, that doesn't take any arguments at this point. So this is a really, really simple example. Um, if I have time towards the end, which it looks like I should, um, I'll try to uh, sort of expand on this and uh, make it more interesting. So up there you can see we've got, so this is an example of EBNF, if you've never seen it before. So very, very simple example of EBNF. 
Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see we've got uh, a call. Uh, it's called a non-terminal. Um, and on the right-hand side, we've got a sequence of tokens. So ID is essentially a token. The bracket is a token. The closing bracket is a token, uh, which is all fed into the parser from the scanner. Um, so I've also got a note up there, you know, that big scary regex basically just means, you know, an ID is basically, you know, a string that starts with an alphabetical character or an underscore followed by zero or more alphanumeric or underscore characters. Okay. So this is an example of Sucklang. It's exciting, right? Okay, so if you'll recall that the scanner takes raw source code, generates tokens, passes it into the parser, that means there needs to be some sort of agreement between the scanner and the parser as to how that data kind of comes in. And so Rack kind of sets the, sets the rule, so to speak, by sort of saying, okay, well, I expect two element sequences uh, from the scanner. And so the first element in you know, the two element sequence that represents a token is the type of the token. Uh, and the second value, uh, the second element in the token is the value. And what I mean by that is if you're passing, uh, say, a string, uh, if you're scanning, sorry, if you're scanning a string, uh, you would say, okay, well, I, I see a quote, there's the contents of the string and another quote, okay, so this is a string token, so the type of the token is a string, but the value of the token would be the contents of the string. Um, and that's important to sort of uh, expose uh, this, that sort of like you know that sort of information to the parser uh, when you're constructing like the AST, for example. Okay, so I think at this point uh, we can sort of get started with the fun part, which is you know writing a compiler, a very very simple compiler. Okay, so oh, you can't see. Uh, okay, so we'll open up libsucklang scanner.rb. Scanner, whoops, the scanner will live in a module called sucklang. Scanner. And we don't really tend to need uh, to keep state around when we're writing a scanner, so I'm just making this a, a module level function. Uh, scan. So the scanner takes raw source code as input. and emits an array of tokens as output. So if we now look back at our grammar, uh, way back here, we can see that we've basically got, we've basically got three tokens. So we've got an ID, opening bracket, and a closing bracket. So let's start out by passing that ID token. So While our input, so we want to consume all the input, uh, which we'll do by just sort of stripping the front off the, the string as we're scanning it. Uh, so when the start of the string contains an alphabetical character or an underscore, followed by uh, zero or nine alphanumeric characters or underscores. So our language isn't Unicode compliant, unfortunately. Um, okay, so we need to generate a token. So this is an ID token. And we want to set the value of this token to the pattern that we just matched here. Uh, oh, what am I doing? So when we match that pattern, this magic variable sort of just evaluates to the text that was matched by that regex. Okay, so we've now matched an ID, but we need to strip off the front of our source string. So I'll use slice, oops. Um, and that's all we need to do to sort of scan a token. Um, so we also need to handle the open and close brackets. So once again, when the string starts with an opening bracket, or a closing bracket. 
we can just use the token itself. So in, in the case of a bracket, there's no value associated with a bracket, right? It's just punctua punctuation. Um, so we don't really care about this value on the right-hand side. It's just kind of a throwaway thing. Um, I'm just throwing it in there you know, more by habit than anything else. Um, and since we're only sort of scanning a single token in this case, we can sort of just use something like that to strip off the, the first character in the, in the string. OK, now we don't want to accept anything else as input. So anything else that we see causes an error. And we'll just, you know, flat out exit. And that should pretty much be our scanner. Uh, so let's write a quick little driver program. Um, Ruby, oh, started writing C. Um, all right, we'll include lib suckling scanner. Uh, so the scanner emits an array of tokens. And we'll just pass the, you know, our sample source program in directly. All righty. All right. So let's see how it goes. Okay. So we're we're sort of chunking that you know raw source code up into into tokens. And this is in a format that, that Rack can kind of start to work with. Um, and sort of just to demonstrate, you know, at this, at this point, we're not applying any strict rules to, to the input. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a legal uh, program so long as it contains characters that the scanner kind of knows about. So, you know, that sort of stuff works as well. Um, but if we, you know, if we, for example, put in a character that uh, the scanner doesn't like, then it will complain. That sort of thing. Um, so, so the scanner, in a, in a sense, sort of enforces um, some level of, of syntax, but you know, it's more in terms of you know weird characters and, and stuff that you don't expect to find on the input at all. Uh, so let's let's modify this so that we can pass in uh, programs from the command line. Uh, now. This isn't going to work because uh, you'll get an implicit uh, carriage return, uh, sorry, line feed. So we try to pass that in, unknown input, blah. Uh, so we'll go back to our scanner, and we'll strip out white space. So when the string starts with white space, get rid of it. OK. So, oh, geez, we're making good time. That's excellent. Uh, OK. So now that we've got our scanner, uh, if you think back to that diagram, uh, the next thing we need to do is implement a parser. And the way we're going to do that is by writing a rack grammar. Um, so the rack grammar is basically, you know, it's, it's sort of a it's sort of pseudo Ruby slash, um, you know, uh, uh, EBNF-ish DSL thing. Um, so I, I guess to start with, make sure you've got Rack installed. Um, once you've done that, you're pretty much ready to go. So what we need to do next is add lib sucklang parser.rack. Now parser.rack, whoops, yep, class. Uh, parser.rack uh, starts out like this. So the name of the module followed by the parser class. Uh, so we want this class, uh, which we're going to call parser, to be in this module, which we're going to call sucklang. So when Rack generates uh, the parser class, it's going to dump it out in, inside the, the sucklang module. So this rule section is where we write our uh, crazy EBNF DSL thing. Uh, so if we go back to our grammar, we can almost use this exactly as is. So we can say, OK, well, the call non-terminal consists of, so 
in EBNF, we use this weird, you know, colon, colon, equals operator, but uh, in, the, in the rack grammar and yak and bias and all that sort of thing, uh, you only need to use a colon. Uh, followed by id, open bracket, close bracket. And we can literally just write it in like that. So once again, just to make it clear, these tokens are coming from the scanner. So these, these are the, the, the token types in your, from, your, from tokens from your scanner. Um, okay, now the other thing we want to do is, um, you know, make it easy to call the parser without sort of, you know, uh, messing around with it too much. So we'll use this thing called an inner section. And the inner section will basically, you know, it basically lets you add whatever code you want to the inside of the parser class. So uh, pass, and we take, you know, a sequence of tokens as input. Uh, and we'll just save those tokens. And then we'll call the, the magical rack function, uh, well, rack, met uh, rack method called do pass, uh, which will actually do the, the heavy lifting of, of passing uh, our tokens. Uh, now we need to tell uh, Rack how to get those tokens, so we need to define a method called next token, uh, which is something that, that Rack is internally aware of. It'll, it'll call this on your behalf. So all we need to do is shift the next token off the front of our token array. And so we'll just keep doing that until we run out of tokens and you know eventually return nil and Rack will go, oh, I'm finished. I don't need to do any, anything more. Okay, and that's pretty much the uh, parser. So now we need to make this kind of evil command line invocation here. Um, so basically all this is doing is running uh, rack via rbmv, um, specifying the output file. So we want to store the output file in libsucklangparser.rb and the input file, you know, libsucklangparser.rack. Uh, okay, so let's do that. Okay, seems to have worked. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll open that up and edit it. Lib suckling parser dot rb. Okay, so this is uh, the Ruby code that that uh, yak uh, yak rack generates on your behalf. Um, you can see our uh, inner section here. So this is dumped in, you know, literally, you know, in place. Uh, and then everything else is sort of, you know, it's, it's generated based upon the, uh, the rules that we specify in our, uh, in our rules section, so over here. Um, you don't have to worry too much about what this actually does. This is the point of using a parser generator. You don't have to worry about, you know, the magic going on on the inside. Uh, okay, now, since I'm going to have to do that a few times, um, I'm going to dump it into a rake file. So when we, uh, uh, sorry, I can't type and think at this point. Um, so we want to generate uh, suckling parser.rb, and it depends on parser.rack. So just execute that. And we'll set the default task to lib suckling parser.rb. So when we, want, when, when we run rake, uh, that'll execute uh, rack on our behalf. OK. So we've implemented a parser, but what does it do at this point? So we, we want to construct an AST during the pass, but at this point, like rack, rack, doesn't, rack doesn't build an AST for you. It, it sort of doesn't define um, the output of, of the pass phase so much. It kind of leaves it up to you to, to, to do that. Um, so just for science, uh, let's open up our driver program again. And we're not returning an AST at the moment, but let's see what Rack does by default. So we'll pass in our tokens. And see what comes of that. Forgot to require it. All 
Okay, so the interesting thing is, from our parser here, we get this string ohi, which sort of corresponds with the identifier value. Um, now, if we go into our grammar, once again, uh, you can see that you know, the, the ID token is the, the first value uh, in, you know, well, the first token uh, in, in the sequence of tokens that make up a call. Um, and what you can actually do in Rack is specify you know, custom actions. And the default action for you know, handling this rule is to set the result equal to the value of the first token. Uh, so this and this are functionally equivalent. It's the same thing. Um, so just to prove that, uh, I'll run rake again because I've modified the grammar, so we need to re regenerate the uh, parser. Uh, and we'll run that example program again. It's the exact same thing. Uh, now, we need to construct an AST. So, so what does an AST look like? I mean, I've, I've spoken about ASTs in you know, sort of a, a really abstract sense. Um, and I guess the best way to sort of demonstrate what an, abs uh, an AST might look like is to sort of ask something like Rubinius. Um, so we'll say, okay, well, whoops, RBM, shell. Oh, I'm already using Rubinius here. So we'll say RBX, compile, S, E, and we'll pass in, you know, because this is sort of legal Ruby syntax as well, we can use Rubinius to sort of give us a hint as to what we're doing here. Okay, so this is giving us a, a sex, which is, you know, sort of a, a, a representation of an ASP, AST uh, as a series of nested arrays. And the node type is the first value in the array, and, you know, sort of children of that node kind of follow. And so here we've got a call, and a call has a target. So you, you can specify a target on which to call a method, right? So if you, if you call foo.ohi, it sets the target of the method to foo. So hopefully that makes sense. It's not really important for what we're doing here, but uh, yeah. So then, then we get this symbol, uh, ohi, which is you know, the, the method that we're trying to call, followed by uh, you know, an empty argument list. So let's do something evil and blatantly copy this. Uh, trackpads are the bane of my existence. Uh, okay, so we, we, we can really dump anything in here, okay? So just to make it clear, you can do like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and set that to the result of your pass, and you'll get that as the output. So here, we're going to literally just dump in that AST from uh, Rubinius. And you know, without modifying it at the moment, Run it again, okay, we get our AST. Now, we don't want to hard code uh, that ohi. Uh, we want to set that to the value of the function that we're trying to call back here. So, we'll set, it, we'll set the, the name of the method that we're trying to call to the value of that ID token. Uh, and I've modified the grammar, regenerate, the Ruby code. Okay, so there's our ohi. Um, and just to prove that it is actually working, you know, so you can see the value of our target changing in the AST. Okay, so we don't need all this junk. So I'm just going to strip out the target. Uh, we're not using it. Uh, for now, we're going to strip out the argument list as well. We can get rid of that. Um, and so, you know, we're just sort of simplifying the AST at this point. So we, we don't need any of that other junk. That's just stuff that Rubinius gave to us. Okay. So there's our simplified AST. So we've got an AST. We've got a parser returning the AST. Uh, all that's left for us to do is to implement a code generator. 
So I sort of um denied for, for a while about you know, what language to use uh, in the code generation side of things. Um, and I settled on C, but you could really use, like for this sort of thing, it's so simple, you could use you know, Ruby or, or JavaScript or you, know, you could probably generate you know, the equivalent JVM bytecode pretty easily as well um, if you wanted to. Um, but we're going to use C. So let's get started and, and just go ahead and implement the code generator. Okay, so once again, module Suglang, module code generator. I'm going to call it class C, just in case we decide to add extra backends later on. So our code generator takes a compile function, which takes an AST as input. So the input will be this guy. And we want to make sure that you know, we're getting the correct node pass in as well. So we'll match on, uh, we'll match on the first item in the array and make sure that it's, it's a script node. Otherwise, it's some sort of error. I won't bother implementing the error function for now. Uh, so when we know we've got a script, uh, we know our language only supports a single function call. So you know the child node here is going to be this call. Uh, so what we're going to do is add a method called compile call, which is the second element in the array. So that guy, and then down here, we'll add compile call. It takes a call node. Once again, we want to make sure that we do definitely have a call node being passed in. Otherwise, it's some sort of error. OK, so we're generating C code. So you know, unlike Ruby, you can't just dump uh, you know, function calls in the, in the middle of a source file. Um, so what we're going to do is generate some, uh, you know, so, uh, like a prelude and a, and a and a, and a footer for the, uh, for the target source file. So what we're going to do is say our output starts with uh, int main. And then we compile our call. And the output ends with return 0 close bracket EOF. All right, so without actually generating the function call, we should get a valid C file at this point. So we'll open up our driver program. And this time, we won't forget to require the code generator module. And we'll basically call the code generator directly with our AST and make sure we get some code at the end. So I'm not really interested in these calls anymore. I've, I've taken it all the way. But the interesting thing you can see here is that, that we're taking you know, our raw source, co source code all the way through to our target code. So um, you know, this, this is essentially the pipeline, the compiler pipeline in source code form. Um, which you know is kind of nice. So if we run this guy, oh, what have I done? You used the wrong version. Oh, did I? Uh, uh, back in the uh, code generator, right. Uh, yep, gotcha. OK, so there's our dumb C file without any function call. Uh, so now we can append. OK, so remember that our AST, wherever that's gone now. So remember our AST for our AST node for call uh, just contains the identifier of the method that we're trying to call uh, as its second element. So we can say call one, open bracket, close bracket, semicolon, slash n. And that's you know, how we generate code for a call AST node uh, in our target language. OK? So we're calling Ohi man here, uh, but we haven't defined that you know, in our C code. 
So what I'm going to do is have main call itself. <laughs> I'm glad you're all following along. <laughs> uh, And kaboom. <laughs> so we have su successfully written a, a parser, uh, a compiler, um, whose sole function is to crash itself, uh, <laughs> which is kind of neat. Um, but you know, maybe we should do something a little bit more interesting. Uh, so we're going to add a bit of a runtime to our, our uh, hypothetical made up crappy language. Um, so we'll define uh, a function called ohi, and ohi we'll call printf. And remember, we're generating C code here, so we need to escape that carriage return. Now the carriage return, the backslash. And include standard io.h and all that sort of fun stuff. OK. <laughs> I did it again. OK, compile it again, and run it. And there's our output. So that's taking us all the way from you know, uh, our very simple beginnings in, in the source code all the way to the end, generating target code and uh, you know, executing it. So we can take that you know, maybe one step further and you know, dump that out to a file. So a.out.c, uh, open it for writing. Write code, and then we'll use system to invoke GCC because we're bad people. Okay, so now when we run our compiler, we get no output, uh, but we should have an a dot out, which you know. So you can kind of hand wave and pretend like you're you're generating native code. Uh, which is kind of fun. Um, now, so I've got, I've got maybe eight minutes left, I think. Um, so if anybody has any questions at this point, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I, I can sort of you know, expand upon what we've already got here and um, keep going forwards. Yes? What would your recommendation be for writing sort of uh, a more sophisticated scan? So you have like uh, more complex tokens that you want to be more aware of. Is there, like, a tool you use? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I sort of chose to write this one by hand because it was, you know, so, so simple that you know it wasn't worth bringing in a new tool. But um, there's there's gems out there called I think like Lexar and uh, RubyLex and things like that, um, which let you do that kind of scanning with sort of less effort and you know I'm, I'm assuming you know uh, more com more complicated tokens as well. I, I think I did a, like a gem search for uh, Lex, and that came up with a whole bunch of useful stuff. Yep. Can you uh, compose grammars so that you can have one kind of you know language, and then say have another SQL language over here, and say this one includes that one, so you can do inline SQL sort of in the first one? Sure. Um, I I think I have heard murmurings of things that have been able to do that. Um, you, to the best of my knowledge, you can't do it with something like Rack. Um, I, I mean, I, I could be wrong. I, I honestly don't know, to, to be honest. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I do know that some research has been done into it because it's, it's the next obvious step, right? You know, uh, when you've got like SQL in your in your code, it just makes sense to kind of you know have it in there rather than you know encode it in a string or something like that. The EBNF will only do context-free grammar, so if you're changing your parsing rules based on where you are in the program, you can't do that with a context. -free. So, so like you can you can use multiple parsers, sort of switch between them based on what you're doing, but you can't write like an EBNF ground that describes something where the rules are different based on what the last thing you parse. Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, so so <laughs> uh, could you repeat that? Um, so it, it essentially, um, sorry, what's your name? Glenn. Glenn. So what Glenn was saying was um, that you you could potentially chunk it up into uh, 
you know, different, different sections of source code and use different passes for each of those sections. Um, but, you know, comp composing EBNF grammars doesn't really work. Does that kind of sum it up pretty much? Cool. Yeah? Could you talk a little bit about the tools provided by Rubinius to write your own implementation or your own parser in the own language? Sorry, I, I can't quite hear you. Could, you. could you talk a little bit about the tools provided by Rubinius to do some of that and to implement your own language? Uh, honestly, I, I don't know a whole lot about Rubinius. Um, I just kind of used it here to, you know, as, as an example. Uh, to generate uh, the AST. It, you're, just, you're taking a peek under the hood at what Rubinius is doing internally. It's not a tool for like, writing your own grammar. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not using Rubinius you know, any, as anything more just to, than just to demonstrate what you know, an AST looks like, essentially. Yep. Just on that topic, though, Rubinius does have numerous easy entry points into building your own language on top of it. Like the Ruby support for many is just one plugin. A plugin basically built yes. using its tooling. It's, it's uh, Rack is really cool, but if you're doing this sort of thing, you should definitely look at, at the Rubinius tool as well. Sure. And, and the, the first day is in your Rack, like the eighth day is in the Rubinius. <laughs> cool. Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to check that out. Uh, yeah. uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, all the representations uh, other than an I, I don't know what else uh, Rubinius provides, um, but uh, you know another example is like a I think I mentioned like a, a concrete syntax tree where you know it doesn't ditch you know all the extra syntax that's kind of included. Um, uh, you know you can directly generate uh, bytecode or native code or whatever directly from within your parser if you're so inclined. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything else. You can also build it through your Yeah, so instead of using those expressions, you can have node pages that are like classes and the same thing, but then you can build it through that way. So it's, you know, roughly equivalent, but there might be things that you want to have. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a Sorry, how, how, does that, how does that differ from like a, an ASD or a conference in text? Right, so if, if you can have an ASD where it knows for object instances rather than arrays with a symbol as the first element. So like an array with a symbol as the first element, you sort of like a poor man's like way of tagging the recipe oh, so, as yeah. an object in a certain time. Oh, you yeah. just yeah. create objects. Yeah, right, right. Um, actually, actually, I kind of prefer that style, um, to be honest. It's just one of those things where you know it's so simple that it's just so much easier to, to use arrays. Yeah. How do you write meaningful tests for this kind of thing? Sorry, what was that? Testing. How do you test something like this? How do you test something like this? Um, you write programs. <laughs> um, you know, you can, you can test all of the individual components in isolation, so you can verify that your, your scanner breaks up tokens in a way that you would expect. Um, you can verify that given a, a set of tokens that your parser constructs uh, an AST that you would expect, um, and you know, given uh, you know, some AST, you could verify that you get the source code at the end that you would expect. Um, so each, each of those individual you know, uh, sections can be you know, tested in isolation. Sure. The risk of shilling for Rubinius, <coughs> the, uh, the compiler test suite in Rubinius is a good example of, of how you can get from the point, you know, from the starting point to where you want to be. You, know, you check out the test with the compiler, and then it has mspec, which is this easily bootstrapped uh, sort of port of rspec, more or less. Sure. And there's tests for that. You can see how once you prove those, you can prove the next thing and move on. OK, so I, I think the answer to that question was uh, use Rubinius. <laughs> check out what kinds of things it tests, and it's, and it's compiler tests, and show you the style. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I want to look at Rubinius now, so. <laughs> um, any more questions? Oh, yes. Have you built any languages of your own using this kind of process that you've open sourced? Uh, yeah, I have actually. If uh, I mean, if you're keen to see a specific example, come and see me afterwards, and, and I can give you some links. Um, it would be good to see a, a more concrete. Right, right. Um, and I'm I'm kind of just about out of time, but um, yeah, I, I understand. I, I was kind of disappointed with the sort of simple example that. You know, I, I kind of had to stick with in the end, mainly due to time cons constraints, right? Um, so I guess, it, it, are there any more questions before I sort of wind things up? Yeah, sure. Just um, from like an educational 
standpoint, do you know any tools that could convert, say, a formal grammar like definition into this workflow so you could start from like a Sorry, do you, do you mean like going back from, backwards from a language to a grammar kind of thing, or? Like from the yeah, like, like grammar to the language, but like oh. formally, right? So basically just some examples kind of thing, like some example grammars? Yeah. Yeah. Um, once, once again, if you, if you want to come and speak to me afterwards, I, I can give you some links to, to stuff like that. Okay. Um, Parsley. Like, build grammars from Parsley like that. Okay. You're guessing like you can take like back to sound form stuff and like feed yep. it into something and get something out. No, I don't know if there's a Ruby thing like that. It'd be cool to work. Yeah. Oh, you mean like something that isn't like necessarily a DSL or? Yeah, like so if you just take like BNF format or one of the standard grammar formats. There's something that can just take that as input and spit out, you know, effectively the starting point for what you did. Uh, okay, sorry. I think I, I think I misunderstood your question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I personally don't know of anything that does exactly that. Um, the best, I mean, the best I could offer is sort of, you know, example rack grammars or, or yak grammars or something like that. Um, all right, so just winding up quickly, um, stuff I didn't cover, more complex grammars um, being the most obvious one. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff um, that kind of comes into compilers but isn't sort of core to you know, implementing a, a very basic compiler if you're just sort of starting out or looking to experiment. Um, so that's it. Uh, once again, we're hiring. Um, come and work for us. Uh, thank you very much.